Hi, everyone, and good evening from Washington, DC. I'm Marina Isgro, Associate Curator of Media and Performance Art at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. It is my pleasure to welcome you this evening to the event with artist Laurel Nakadade and curator Lily Siegel. Tonight, we'll be screening Laurel's video, Greater New York, part of the Hirshhorn's collection. And then Laurel, Lily, and I will be in conversation. This event is part of Viewfinder, women's film and video from the Smithsonian, a year long virtual screening and conversation series featuring moving image works by women across Smithsonian collections. It is generously sponsored by the Smithsonian American Women's History Initiative. Our next monthly screening is Howardina Pindell on the performance of autobiography on October 7th at 5.30 p.m. For more information about upcoming events in the series, please visit womenshistory.si.edu. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather. Uh, for myself in Washington, DC, the Nacotchtank or Anacostan and Piscataway people, as well as the diverse native communities who make their home here today. To learn more about the native peoples and histories where you are, some useful tools are the digital map Native Land and the National Congress of American Indians Directory of Tribal Representation. And we'll place links to both of those resources in the chat. Uh, we have live closed captioning available tonight, which can be accessed along the bottom menu. There you can also find the Q&A function where we, we invite you to submit questions to be answered during the second half of the event. Um, and now let me introduce Laurel and Lily. Laurel Nakadade first made a splash in the art world with a group of videos in which she recruited single middle-aged men to join her in performances which she filmed. These included, for example, one in which she visited men's apartments and danced with them to a song by Britney Spears. I first encountered Laurel's work in depth during her major exhibition at MoMA PS1 in 2011 and had an immediate visceral reaction to what she had to say about the simultaneous vulnerability and power of moving through the world as a young woman. But over time, I've come to understand this work more broadly as being about the desire to connect with other human beings and the unexpected, awkward, funny, and tender encounters that can unfold between us. And over the past few weeks talking with Laurel, I've also learned that these videos speak on yet another level to the artist's own family history and to American history. Laurel began her artistic career as a photographer, and after a period of focusing on video and feature film, now works primarily in that medium. Her recent work extends her interests in strangers and relations, vulnerability and intimacy into new directions. Laurel's work is in the collections of MoMA, the Whitney, LACMA, the Guggenheim, and many other institutions. Laurel and I will be joined in conversation this evening by Lily Siegel. Lily is executive director of Hamiltonian Artists in Washington, DC. Before joining Hamiltonian, she was executive director and curator at Tefra Institute of Contemporary Art, formerly the Greater Reston Arts Center, where she curated exhibitions with artists such as Sue Warbican, Caitlin Teal Price, Stephanie J. Williams, and Mike Cloud. She also organized the first major exhibition of the paintings of Paulina Peavy and an exhibition and catalog of the work of Moira Dreyer at the Phillips Collection and Tefra ICI. Uh, Lily is currently working with Tefra ICI and George Mason University to present an exhibition of Laurel's work in three parts, which we are very excited about. Um, the exhibitions will highlight the artist's most recent bodies of work that investigate her personal family history, love and loss through a matriarchal frame. Works on view will include selections from the series Relations and The Kingdom, which will be shown in its entirety for the first time. Laurel and Lily will also organize the third iteration of the exhibition Mother, which the artist first curated at Leslie Tonkinot in 2018. And now please join me in viewing Greater New York, which is about five minutes long. The screening will be followed by a live conversation and an audience Q&A. Thank you. Okay. Well, welcome, Laurel. Welcome, Lily. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Good to be here. So, um, gosh, the video is so great. It just, every time I watch it, I see new things in it, and there's so much that we could talk about. Um, but I wanted to start by just um, asking you, Laurel, about a phrase that you used to describe it in the past. 
Um, you said the work is about little tragedies and how they meet the world's larger tragedies, which I thought was so nicely put. Um, so I wanted to ask you if you could expand on that a little bit and tell us kind of how this video initially came into being. I mean, it's so interesting. I haven't watched that video in many years. Um, I think something we haven't said yet is that a lot of that video was shot to sort of 2001 to 2003 sort of time period. So it's nearly 20 years old, most of that footage. Um, so just to look back on it is a really sort of strange and visceral experience for me, sort of thinking back half my lifetime ago um, as a person, as an artist. And I, I think in many ways, I, that video was made in the sort of free fall post 9-11, the sort of grief that we felt in New York and the country after 9-11. It also happened to align with sort of the first moments that I was an adult in the real world. Um, you know, I uh, finished graduate school in May of 2001, moved to New York City, and everyone's lives changed. So in many ways, I look back and I think it's sort of a visual diary of that time. It's this, you know, sort of grappling with what it meant to record my life on camera, to use the camera as a witness, to um, think about the ways that I could document what was happening in my life and then sort of how my life met the greater world. Um, but it's, it's fascinating for me to look at it now, 20 years later. Yeah. Well, maybe you could just say a little bit about how you happened to, um, capture that footage of September 11th. Um, so yeah, I lived in New York city on 9-11 and I woke up and I had planned to go out at the time I was making these, um, undercover girl scouting videos where I would wear a surveillance camera and, you know, walk around the city and have interactions with people pretending to be a, a lost Girl Scout. Um, it was just like early video art piece, performance piece, right? Um, I'm not even sure I've ever shown that work. I think there's many like hours of just undercover surveillance of New York City in 2001. Um, but I woke up that morning and that's what I planned to do. And 9-11 happened and I went up to the roof of my building in the East Village and j just kept recording. Um, Nobody knew it was 9-11 yet, right? Nobody knew what was happening. I, I certainly didn't, I didn't have any real, um, you know, gigantic tragedy I'd lived through at that point. So that was, that was this big moment that I think everyone was trying to process. I remember in that moment feeling very scared along with everyone else, right? Um, but also feeling like if I kept documenting what was happening that I had some control over, over my fate in that moment. Right. Um, and so again, the camera served as this witness or this protector for yeah. me. Yeah. Well, something I didn't realize until we started um, talking about this program was that the, the scenes in which you actually salute the camera um, are references to the series of photographs by Dorothea Lange. So I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit more about that. So I, and I don't even know how I sort of had the wherewithal in that moment to, to do that. Yeah. But it, in that moment, I felt such fear and such sort of worry for anyone who didn't look like what many people might call an American. Um, and of course my family lived through World War II, was incarcerated by the US government um, in Japanese American internment camps. Um, you know, one of my first thoughts when 9-11 happened was that many of us would not be safe and that um, unnecessary retaliation against people who perhaps didn't appear to belong would occur, which we then, of course, found out did occur. Um, and so in that moment, I think I was thinking this sort of proving of this sort of this patriotic act of saluting in that moment was this sort of performed maybe real patriotism that I felt might keep me safe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what we know is that often um, people have to perform this sort of overt patriotism in order to survive. And I feel like in that moment, that's sort of what I was trying to to talk about. And, it, you know, certainly that's what Dorothea Lange's images of the Japanese American school children pledging allegiance to the flag in the days before they were incarcerated, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think part of the reason I was so interested to hear you talk about this is because the question of racial identity just really was not in any of the reviews of this work at the time, like yeah. around 2005 or even 2011. 
Um, so I wonder if you could just say a little bit about maybe that absence and, and how the reception of the work has changed over time or even how your own understanding has or has not changed. Yeah, yeah, it's so, I mean, it's so interesting to me now to be showing this work and discussing it because I feel like finally people are talking about this, the, the race elements that we didn't talk about in the early aughts. I think that, um, of course, the work was always about being a mixed race Asian American woman. It was about my Asian body in that space. It was about my vulnerability, my power. It was about all of these things. And some of it was discussed, certainly. Um, but I think as we've discovered 20 years later, maybe we're beginning to build some tools to actually have real conversations about those things. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I should, I, one of the things I think that's interesting that has never really been talked about in my work is that the earliest work I made, which was these interactions with strangers I met through chance encounters, through men I met through chance encounters. And the earliest um, ideas, the, the ideas that launched that project were that both of my great grandmothers were picture brides. And in that summer between college and graduate school, I was shown photographs of these great grandmothers. And I remember in that moment, just thinking nothing else is more important than telling the sort of story of women who are who moved to a country they've never been to, to marry a man they've never met, to build a life and trust the process. Um, and I, I decided I would then like recreate that. I would go out into the world and I would try to build a life on camera with a man I'd never met, who I met through a chance encounter. Um, and that was really the, the earliest inspiration for that project, but nobody ever talked about it, you know? Um, and I don't know if it's that people just wanted it, the answer to be simple, and that once you start talking about race, it gets very complicated very quickly for, for a lot of people who just don't have the tools to have that conversation. Um, but I welcome it now. I'm so, I'm so excited to have this conversation. I'm so excited to, as you said, like revisiting the work is a wonderful thing, actually, to be able to dip back into the sort of history of my work and yeah. think about the ways we might view it differently now. Well, I have another question about revisiting the work, um, which is, as we've said, a lot of this was filmed in 2001, which was really before the advent of social media. Mm -hmm. um, but so much of, of this video and your early work is really about kind of the public performance of the self um, in a way that really anticipates what we're now so used to seeing on, on Instagram and other platforms. So I wonder if you could say something about that. I think I was joking with Lily after I watched this for the first time in many years. I was like, well, it just looks like YouTube, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and it but like in a really interesting way, because it really anticipated this sort of obsession with living life on camera, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I was always really just interested in the ways that pop culture met private lives and sort of performance of that. One of the other early inspirations, in addition to the picture brides, was um, teenagers dancing in their bedrooms, because every teenager has done this, right? Every teenager dancing in their bedrooms to whatever the big song was of that moment. But there's something really beautiful about the idea that everyone's done that, and also vulnerable and embarrassing, And but everybody's done it, right? Um, and so that, that for me was also, and I, part of me feels like YouTube was pretty much invented for dancing and cats, right? So, <laughs> and it's like this yes. video is dancing and these sort of moments of the natural world witnessing us and being witnessed and these like squirrels and raccoons and, you know, it's like, how is this not just like the trailer for YouTube made in 2001 before YouTube, but like not to like knock the video, but to say, isn't that amazing that like, I was interested in all of these things that now sort of lapped me and now YouTube will go on and be the great yeah. thing that I was sort of doing the like groundwork in the late nineties and early aughts of recording a life and having these sort of- Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, the soundtrack is also part of that. Um, you know, it makes me think of like TikTok as well as YouTube yeah. and Instagram. Um, the whole soundtrack is these like quintessential sort of perfect pop songs like so much of your work at the time. I like pick these pop songs that were almost embarrassing and they're yeah. right. Like if you really crank it and you're driving, like you're probably gonna be kind of embarrassed, but you're really enjoying it. So like you just, <laughs> you know, and like, yeah, you could pick your friends based on who identified, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, well, I want to leave plenty of time to talk about um, Laurel's recent work. So I'm going to turn it over to Lily now, who will um, kind of manage that part of the conversation. Thank you. Before we move on, I actually, because we were talking about how your older work was received and thinking about reading reviews and responses to the older work, a word that comes up over and over again is sensational and sensationalism. And thinking about um, really how unfair that is. And now that we're all used to this performance in a private public space, um, thinking about how it's not necessarily sensational, but how that for some reason, my mind went to, you know, social media and performing identity. And of course, in this past year, especially seeing um, this social media activism around various issues and, um, you know, trying to figure out what people are genuinely saying and what people are just performing. And I think that your work really touched on that before all of these bigger issues were here. And um, yeah, so this, this idea of sensationalism, I think just was so prevalent. I think in every single piece of writing I've read about your work from the early 2000s, that word was used. It's so interesting because, and I love that you said that because I feel like, well, then let's take apart the parts, right? It's a woman using her own body to tell a story about her, her experiences in the world and, um, constructed narratives built with people she's met, right? But it's like suddenly there's like, it's, it's, it's this thing that people just can't process, right? I remember at one point I was in a, I did a talk and then at the end someone said, what gives you the right to use your body in this way? And all I could think is you've removed my own agency, right? You've said, I don't have the right to my own body. And they said it out loud with their mouth, right? And I, and I thought, you know, how, do, how why should I even care about the reaction after that? If I don't even get to own my own body in this work, then why do I care what anyone says about it, you know? But that was part of it, right? Like that was part of it, like stripping me of my own power identity, that was, part of why the work was made, right? It was yeah. a young Asian American woman making work about being a young Asian American woman and the violences against that against me, the cat calls, the, you know, some of the earliest work was cast through men cat calling me. And then I would say, oh, do you want to make a video? Um, and so sort of turning the camera back on them after they'd objectified me on the street in New York. And um you know, sort of the problem was the reason to do it. But I, I, I feel like, I don't know, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, well, I wanna add something now too, <laughs> which is just thinking about um, that question of agency and in response to Greater New York specifically, um, the response that some people had, which was like, what gives you the right to include September 11th in mm -hmm. this film, right? right? Like how, what ownership do you have over right. this tragedy? Right. Um, and there's something about like people being afraid to let you have that agency. Yeah, you know? and you, I look back and I'm like, so what part of me, what part of me as an Asian American person doesn't get to have had that experience? Right. What part of me physically being two miles from 9-11 on the morning of 9-11 removed free me from being able to witness it? Right. So it's sort of a moment for people to analyze why they felt that way. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. All right. Now the new work. <laughs> okay. Um, Lily, do you want me to just show some new work and then talk about it? Or do you want me to um, go ahead? Yeah, and... why don't you show the work and then we can, people will know what we're talking what about. What we're talking about, right. And you can jump in too, if you want. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and screen share this keynote and I'm gonna um, jump ahead quite a bit um, from, where we left off with that video. Um, that video, as I said, was shot between 2001 to 2003, four. I think it premiered at the 2005 um, Greater New York. Um, so I'm time traveling ahead about 10 years. So in 2011, um, right after my show Greater New York closed, I was in this sort of in this place of wanting to sort of reboot and, and find a new way to make work. And I also knew I didn't want to be in my work. Um, sort of everything that we've been talking about, the sort of 
criticism that I was subjected to, fair or unfair, from the first sort of decade of my um, career was had gotten to the sort of fever pitch place where I just didn't want to be in my work anymore. And it was really, I think, a way of sort of protecting myself in that in that moment. Um, so at the time, I was thinking a lot about the work of Mike Disfarmer. So I was thinking about this idea of recording a town or recording as many people in a place as I could. Um, I was also interested in the idea of creating a sort of moving photo studio, the idea of um, taking a camera and, and a single flashlight with me out into the world and finding a way to sort of just make pictures out in the world again. Um, so I ended up um, posting on social media that I would be in a specific place at a specific time and I would invite anyone from the town to come be photographed. Um, and so this is in Arizona, you know, I posted on like Facebook, friends of friends, anyone could show up and be photographed. Um, I recorded these sort of first moments where I could see them um, using only a single flashlight and ambient lights, so a starlight, any light coming from the sort of deep distance of a, a city or a town. Um, and so these serve as these sort of documents of these first moments of meeting these strangers. Um, and I wanted, you know, I wanted the photographs to, to serve in this way as a sort of document of the moment of meeting, because I was really interested in the ways that, um, again, the camera could witness, but also how the camera could serve as, as a sort of, and here they were, and this is what they looked like. And you stood six feet from one another, and they stood still. And this is the document of this life in this moment, not so dissimilar from what Dis Farmer did. Um, so I shot like this for, I think a year, maybe 18 months. And then I ended up taking a DNA test. Um, I took an a DNA test because my mother was obsessed with the idea that when she was 10 or 11 years old, that there had been a baby that had lived in her home and then had disappeared and no one had ever spoken about the baby again. Um, my mother was just obsessed with the idea that we would find this baby. So we took these DNA tests because she thought maybe the baby would show up on DNA tests. Um, we got our results back and there was no like obvious baby that maybe matched us close relative. But what I found was that across America, I had thousands of DNA matches. And, you know, now 10 years later, we know that, um, you know, lots of people take these tests and it's a pretty common like holiday present, you know, everybody does it. Um, but back when I did it, there were not as many, it was not as common that people would take this test. It was still very expensive. It was not as people didn't really trust it. Um, and so the people who were, who had taken this test were really open and happy to be contacted. Um, because they were all there searching for something, um, whether it was they were searching for family members, they were searching for maybe just, you know, the history, their DNA, their, uh, their health results, whatever it would be, but they were searching for something. And so I started emailing these DNA relatives on 23andMe and Ancestry.com. And then over the next five years, I traveled 50,000 miles crisscrossing America to make portraits of these DNA relatives. Um, and so everyone in the photographs from here forward shares DNA with me. Um, I saw these as self-portraits because I, despite not wanting to be in front of the camera, ended up photographing people who shared DNA with me. So they sort of, for me, became these sort of modern day self-portraits. Um, and I would just, um, you know, I would email, they'd write back and then I'd, you know, write down like so-and-so says they'll participate and I'd sort of gather names. And then once I got, you know, two or three or four people in an area, I would fly in, get a rental car and then drive around photographing. Um, I could only do so many shoots a night because I needed to shoot in this sort of time after sunset where it was dark enough to photograph, but not so late at night that no one would show up. So I had this sort of two hour window where I could make these photographs. Um, they're really long exposures. This exposure was probably 20, 25 seconds. And then in the middle of the exposure, I paint the person's figure with a flashlight. So again, like documenting this sort of moment of witnessing one another. Um, I thought this, man was incredible. He brought out his newborn baby. Um, there's this sort of, you know, generosity in this project that these strangers showed up to be photographed, um, that they agreed to allow me to witness their lives standing in darkness, which is a really vulnerable place to be with a stranger. Um, it's also a really beautiful place to be, this idea of two humans standing 
you know, after sunset in darkness together, experiencing the moment is a really beautiful and vulnerable and generous thing. So um, this is what I did for, I would say five years. Um, I traveled to every state except for um, Maine, Alaska and Hawaii. So almost everywhere in the, in America. So this um, continued on for, for quite a while. I realized at a certain point, it wasn't just about the people, but it was about these landscapes. It was about standing in these landscapes at night. Um, and it was about, um, you know, the sort of ways that I could still be surprised by photography, the ways that each night I would go out and trust this process and trust that a photograph would materialize from this thing. Um, you know, I teach and I often talk to students about just believing that the world will support the work if they just go out and start. And so it's not necessarily about having all the answers, but it's about trusting that the art will be made through the doing of the art. Um, this is my great uncle who I met for the first time this night. I met him through DNA. Um, his brother is my grandfather, but my grandfather died in 1966, so I never met him. So this was sort of the first moment of meeting someone related to him, other than my mother. Um, that's the other thing is every single person who participated in this DNA project was related to me through my mother's side. Um, my father also tested, but he only had 12 matches. Um, he's Japanese American and there just are not very many Japanese American people. Um, I think we make up less than half of 1% of the American public. So um, it's been really difficult to get participants on my father's side, but I, I do hope that I will be able to ultimately photograph his side. Um, over the last decade, there have been more um, people join. So after I shot that project for about five years, um, I got this email from somebody on Ancestor DNA, and they said that they were most likely closely related to me. Um, I got this email when I was eight months pregnant, um, and my mother was actually very sick at the time. So I got this email and I wanted to immediately, oh, and so this was the baby. This was the baby who my mother had been looking for most of her life. Um, her brother actually had had a child when he was a teenager with his teenage girlfriend and the baby had been raised by extended family on the mother's side. Um, so we've now met, I'm planning to actually make his picture when I can get down to Texas at some point. Um, but this was big news for my mother because she had been searching for him her whole life. Um, she was extremely sick at the time. And so I um, flew to Oregon with my four week old baby and um, delivered the news to her that he had been found and she died two days later. So it's, you know, it's one of those moments where I feel like, and then this, this is the book of um, the DNA project, which is called Strangers in Relations and was published by the Des Moines Art Center a few years ago. Um, it's one of those moments where I realized everything I've ever made as an artist is based on some experience of mine or experience of a family member or um, something that happened in my life that caused me to not be able to look away from something. And I think that this was one of those moments where I realized that my mother's experience had actually become my experience through the making of this project. And that finding the baby for me had been, became as important as it had been for her. Um, so after my mother died, the thing that I couldn't stop thinking about was the fact that she had never gotten to hold my son. Um, by the time I got to Oregon with my four week old, um, she was in a coma, so she was not able to hold him. Um, as a photographer, I think, you know, that was sort of the photograph I never got to make. It was the photograph that was impossible. Um, and so I went through snapshots of my mother's things after she died. And I found my mother's things after she died. And I took these snapshots and then I found snapshots of my son. Um, and I responded to a spam message that came in shortly after she died that said, um, Photoshop services for sale, we can fix anything. And so I responded to this person who had advertised Photoshop services saying they could fix anything and said, can you please put the baby in the woman's arms? And so I allowed the stranger to participate in this grief 
that my mother never got to hold my son and he who or she or they I don't I don't even know who the stranger is which is also part of the sort of beautiful thing right that I don't know who this person is who I was writing to um and they combined these pictures of my mother and my son and they created these pictures that couldn't exist and can't exist but they created this world in which we follow um my mother through her life in snapshots and my son is inserted in this sort of terrible Photoshop that's like clunky and imperfect, but also for me heartbreaking and a reminder of why photographs are important and why photography matters. Um, so uh, this, so yeah, so, but once again, using photography to, you know, describe the sort of longing and heartbreak and and imperfect life. Um, but yeah, the Photoshop's terrible, but that's sort of what makes it amazing, right? Like the fact that the pictures are so badly Photoshopped because it speaks to the impossibility of the work. It speaks to the impossibility of um, these lives being here together in this way. Um, my son, when he sees these photographs now, he's five now, and he, when he sees these photographs, he says, that's me with Grandma Mary. Um, and he believes that he's being held by her. And so, you know, what does that mean that these photographs could create a world for my son in which he believes he was held by his grandmother? And maybe that's enough, right? Maybe that was enough for this project. Um, I think it's also a moment to just speak about sort of embarrassing vulnerability because to make this project was deeply vulnerable to say like, I'm up at night grieving that my mother never held my child. Um, I think that so often, you know, parents are asked to sort of parent in, in private. And I think that grief is also something we are expected to do in private. Um, and I, as an artist and a person have always sort of felt like saying the real thing out loud as loud as I can. Um, and I think that these photographs sort of do that. They say this, this thing out loud as loud as they can and it's embarrassing and it's hard, but it's real. Um, so this is the, one of the last photographs I ever made of my mother and among the first photographs ever shot of my son. Um, and what I loved about this was that the Photoshop person who put these together put her hand in his hand. Um, and there was this sort of relationship, I think, that began to form with the person combining these images. Um, I sent to them, them to the person sort of in order. So the last pair on the last day that I requested this to be done was this photograph. And I felt like it was this message from the Photoshop technician that they understood the project. Like they understood that what I wanted was for my child to be in my mother's arms and to have this connection. So there's this moment where their hands are touching where all I could think was there's a stranger, someone in the world, somewhere in the world who gets it, who gets this. And that was huge. That was a really big moment for me as an artist and a maker. So um, that work was shown at Leslie Tonkino in New York in a show called The Kingdom. Um, uh, right before my mother died, um, when my son was born, I was FaceTiming her to show her the baby in this like gut-wrenching FaceTime of like, please look at him before you die. Um, and she looked at him and my niece was on her lap and she was two at the time or something. And she was holding my niece and then she looked at my child, my son on FaceTime and she said the kingdom. And it was the last thing she ever said. So um, I called the show, The Kingdom. I don't, I still don't know exactly what it means but I love the fact that my mother named my last show. Um, and so this piece is a piece that I put in which is um, audio recordings of all of the last voicemails my mother left me um, over the last like three years of her life, the sort of sign offs of the voicemails. Um, one really interesting story about this piece and the main reason I wanted to show it is that I bought the um, camera, or sorry, not the camera, the phone booth enclosure um, on eBay. And I ordered it, it was sort of way too late in the process and it shipped and then it like, it wasn't traveling very quickly to New York City and I didn't understand why it wasn't there and the show was about to open. The wall had been painted, the photos were up. We're like, where is the phone booth? Where is the phone booth? And I tracked it and 
it was in Odessa, Texas, which we now know is where the baby was born, who my mother was always searching for. And so it was stuck at a FedEx or a UPS or something in Odessa, Texas. And um, then it started tracking again and made it to New York City two days later. But that was just one of those moments where I couldn't deny that I needed to do the show and the sh doing the show was right. Um, so the last pieces I'll show are, they're called the last Polaroids. And um, I had hoarded Polaroid film once when we thought Polaroid would never, instant film would never exist anymore. So I hoarded all of this Polaroid and kept it in the fridge. Um, you know, right before my mother died, I, I decided I would shoot every last Polaroid I owned of my mother. Um, and so I did that, the, the film had of course expired and degraded. And so the way a Polaroid, uh, like a Polaroid 600 works is that the Polaroid pod is broken as it passes through these rollers. And so you can see that the rollers spread the developer unevenly. And also the Polaroids are underexposed because as um, Polaroid ages, it becomes less light sensitive. And so these are underexposed ill-developed expired Polaroids that feel exactly how I felt as I made this work. So again, a moment in which photography can tell a story greater than just, you know, the, the, the subject, but that the surface of the photograph tells a story too. Um, so I think that is where oh, I have this last piece to show, but um, I think that's almost where I'm going to end. The, uh, the last piece that was in that show, The Kingdom, was this wall of snapshots, almost Instagram style of my son. And it's one day for every day that my dad was in the um, Minidoka concentration camp in Hunt, Idaho. Um, this um, series started because when my son turned one, I found myself obsessively thinking about this photograph of my dad in Minidoka um, and thinking about my grandmother, thinking about his mother, what it would be on your child's first birthday to have to take them into a concentration camp. And so um, I installed this work, which was all of these photographs of my son um, at the same age that my father had been in the camp. And then on the opposite wall, lonely by itself, this one photograph of my dad. Um, so there's more to say about that project, of course, but I think we'll run out of time. So I think I'll stop sharing. Um, Thank you. That was really a beautiful narrative. I couldn't interrupt. <laughs> um, but it, I mean, vulnerability is something that you really display so generously in your work and when speaking about your work. And I wonder you know, speaking somewhat personally myself, I find it sometimes easier to be more vulnerable in front of strangers and thinking about how you were able to create your work from the early days all the way through now, um, if that allowed a greater vulnerability for you. And also when photographing other people and, you know, you think about, oh, when, grandma wants to take another picture, everyone in the family grimaces, and oh, not another one, but here comes you, a family member, um, often asking for that person to be vulnerable with you and to really be looked at. Um, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, there's so many sort of moments to unpack in that question, but I think for me, there was always something very interesting about being vulnerable with strangers because it sort of allowed people an opportunity to be vulnerable back. You know, it was an opportunity for the strangers to find sort of space in our interaction to be the person they wanted to be in that intera interaction. Um, yeah, and I also think, I don't know if you were sort of leaning towards this at all, but the sort of DNA portraits of family members, essentially like distant family members, I feel like there was often immediately a sort of implied trust that we had for one another because we shared DNA, which is an interesting thing because many people in America share DNA, but it doesn't mean they're gonna get along and it doesn't mean they have anything in common. Um, but standing in the darkness with these strangers, I always felt like there was sort of this unspoken trust we had for, with one another, which 
is hard to describe. You know, it's hard to describe sort of that feeling in that moment. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, you didn't show um, 365 days, but I know that that's another earlier work that you've revisited recently. And a lot of that is about, I think, performing vulnerability and um, actually putting yourself in that space then again um, and revisiting it now is the first time I think you put yourself on actual social media um, yeah. <laughs> and wondering. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Um, maybe I'll just describe that for a second. Um, so okay. three, yeah. 365, yeah, I didn't, I guess I didn't show any of this. Um, 365 days was a one year performance in which I forced myself to cry every day and I documented the sort of moment either before, during, or after that performance. Um, for me, it was sort of pushing myself to the limit of sort of what I could do as a performer um, in private spaces. So once again, it was these, you know, it was a private performance that happened only for me, but then was shown to the public when it finished. Um, it was never put on social media despite being inspired by social media. Um, the social media of, you know, 2009, 2010 was still a very polite social media of um, performing happiness, greeting cards, you know, people who went to high school finding one another and guess what, everybody's doing great, you know. Um, that was sort of the social media of that moment. And I really wanted to push back against it. And so I decided that every day for a year I'd cry. I didn't post them on social media at that time because I felt like it was too direct. I don't know, I just thought that it was just too direct and that the work should be shown in a gallery or a museum and that I didn't need to have the conversation with the conversation. Um, but 10 years later, I decided I would re-perform it. And so um, in 2020, I re-photographed from the pages of the 365 Days catalog, um, a square Instagram sized, you know, scale photograph um, in which I allowed the light of 2020 to interact with the surface of the photograph from 2010. So once again, allowing not just the content of the photograph to tell the story, but the surface of the print, the sort of um, photograph's own journey to tell the story. So um, those pictures were all posted to at 365 underscore tears um, on Instagram and they live there now as this sort of one year performance, re-performance of 365 days. Um, and that was, of course, the, the last project I made right before Strangers in Relations. And so that was just one more sort of data point of not wanting to be on camera for a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, I'm not sure. I don't have a full thought here, but time and chronology plays a really important part in your work, too. And it's subtle. And I don't know that I've figured out quite how you're using it yet. <laughs> um, but, you know, marking time um, through photographs of others and yourself and creating a diary, but it seems more like writing a history actually or rewriting a history maybe um, that again, you know, come back to the term generous that you, it's almost painful for me to think of your work being categorized as sensationalist because I see it so much as the opposite of being generous and vulnerable and offering so much as, um, you know, rewriting a history or offering another perspective. So can you talk about time? Help me understand maybe a little bit more. I, like I sort of like went into like a sort of state of trying to sort of go through all my work and think about that. Um, what I will say is that I think I've always really been interested in the ways time changes us, right? I've really, I've always been interested in the ways a photograph is already a lost moment, right? Or a past moment. Um, I think that because I've always been interested in time-based art, meaning performance, video, photography, books, like these are all time-based, right? So maybe that's also part of it, but I think Time is what breaks our hearts, right? The passing of time, not being able to go backwards, um, the sort of falling off of yesterday and 
being left with the sort of holding the sort of broken bits of what we saved, right? It also heals us. And what? It also heals us. It also, yeah, like time heals us, time or gives us perspective to find ways to be okay-ish or, you know, um, it, it, it's the thing we can't control, right? And it's the thing that we are part of no matter what. And so, and until we're not, right? And, but then we are because we're in the past tense, right? I, so maybe that's part of it. I think what I love about your question though is it leaves room for the possibility of understanding in the future, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like the idea that that question might be inserted in this moment today and we might solve it one day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and what will you do with your work you're do making today in 10 years? <laughs> I know, right? Like what, where does it go? And, you know, I think that's one of the things that's been humbling for me as an artist is to think, so my, I've been making work for 20 years as a grown up, right? Um, what, what will the work look like to me in 20 years? Like this was a pretty jarring experience to see <laughs> greater New York, um, but is it exciting the idea that in 20 years, there's the possibility of other feelings we haven't felt? Yeah. Yeah. The last thing I think related to that actually is talk, let's talk a little bit about Mother and you're curating that show and bringing in other artists and why you did it in 2018 and um, you know why we're doing it again now. Seems obvious that it's a very relevant and urgent theme still and probably will be in 10 years. Um, but I think, you know, you've said that that came out of your kingdom series and um, the way that women, specifically mothers, are portrayed in photography. But again, um, you know, offering yourself, but through this generous act of asking others to be in front of the camera, so to speak, to be on the walls, to tell their stories. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the first time you organized the show? Yeah, so one of the things that happened from that came out of the Kingdom Project series was that other people started talking to me about their mothers. Um, and nobody was um, able to sort of hold back in that moment. Everybody had very strong feelings about the stories they were telling me about their mothers. And I realized... I really wanted to look at the at work made by artists about their mothers. I felt like, wouldn't it be incredible to make a show in which artists spoke about this person who was so important to them? Um, and I also felt like there weren't many conversations happening about mothers and motherhood in that moment. This was, um, you know, so sort of coming together in like 2017, 2018. Now I think we're having lots of conversations about mothers and motherhood. Um, I think it, it was sort of just starting to percolate, you know, there were a few other people also thinking about it in that moment. And I think it's really grown since then, but in that moment, it was a sort of lonely topic. And I think it was also um, a topic that not many people wanted to talk about because they didn't see it as serious. They didn't see it as this sort of, serious thing to talk about like mothering or motherhood or mothers it just seemed like something that should be in private and we shouldn't talk about it um but Leslie Tonkin I was really also very enthusiastic about the show and so we decided we would co-curate this show together and it I think was extremely successful meaning lots of people felt things when they saw it um and it was a moment for me in which I felt like being able to have these conversations with other artists about mothers and motherhood was both healing for me as a person who had just lost my mother and had just become a mother. Um, but the sort of conversations that begin to form are really uh, important, really important. Yeah. Great. So maybe we'll, we'll pause there and see if we have any questions from the audience, unless you had another question, Lily. 
No, I think that was, we can keep talking if there are <laughs> other questions. <laughs> so if you do have a question, um, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. You can just type it right in there. I did get one question offline, um, which was about your shift from working primarily in video to working primarily in still photography um, and kind of what motivated that shift and what you sort of, you know, value in each of those different mediums. So I feel like each project I've made found the form it needed to find, the story found the form it needed. Um, I'm now working on a feature length film. So I've sort of gone back to the other side again. Um, making those early videos felt like the sort of urgent form they needed to find. Um, I was really in love with just the pictures could move and that they could accumulate into frames that became a sort of moving jumble of something that was really important to me in the late nineties and early aughts. Um, the photographic projects I felt needed to be photographs because they told stories about photographs themselves, right? Like the form had a conversation about itself. Um, I then, we didn't talk about this, but I made two feature films after that actually. Um, and so I spent two or three years just like shooting and editing feature films, which is not an easy task for, you know, one person at home on their laptop. Um, and so I think that after I finished those feature films, I really wanted to slow down and be really deliberate for a little bit. And so that's sort of how I've decided to make pictures for a while. Um, I think it's just really more, what is the story? How should it be told? What is the form? The form is found through trying to solve it. And that's where we are. I, yeah, I don't know. I'm making a film now, so. That's very exciting. Um, well, I guess I don't think we have any other questions. So this is your last chance if you want to submit one. <laughs> In the meantime, um, I want to just thank both of you so much for joining us, Laurel and Lily. Um, I am so excited to see the shows when they happen. And um, for those of you watching, please join us next time um, for a conversation with Howardina Pindell. That'll be again on October 7th at 5.30 p.m. So thank you everyone. And um, yeah, see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Laurel. Thank Thanks, you, Bye-bye.